A proposal going around in college football that could be a lifeline for teams in the ACC and the Big 12. You are Locked On College Football, your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth, realignment, coaching, carousel, the portal, and more. We've always got you covered. We'll check in with the Miami Hurricanes. Alex Donna will be here and... We'll talk ACC contenders as well, which is uh, more than a little bit fascinating in that conference landscape. But here's something that every ACC fan has to be aware of and in the Big 12 or just college football in general. So College Sports Tomorrow or CST is the name that this proposal is garnering. It is made up of university presidents, decision makers, a high level executive from the NFL and it is a massive restructuring of the sport of college football, and I think it would be great. I, I think there is so much good stuff in here. This this was first reported over at, at The Athletic, I believe, and other outlets have picked it up, and I, I was reading this stuff and getting ready for, for today's segment, and I got to tell you, I was excited because of all the changes in college football that have gone down, I haven't liked very many of them. People who have listened to or watched my show for a long time know that I'm not wild about all this stuff. This could fix realignment. That I, I'm, I'm not overstating things here. This could fix realignment. So the proposal on this uh, Super League, which has kind of an ominous phrase, right? Maybe because a lot of us, I hope a lot of us, watched Ted Lasso and the Super League was actually going to harm the sport and leave people behind. This would actually be a really good model. So you'd have seven 10-team divisions, in which you have those 70 schools as permanent members of the upper tranche of college football. Then you would create a second tier with the 50 or more FBS programs, and there would be an eighth division in which the teams that are in that second tier would have a relegation model to get into that division, have a chance to win it, and get an automatic berth to the college football playoff. You would have 16 playoff spots under this proposal. You would have the eight division winners, and you would have eight wild card spots. There would be no college football playoff committee. I'm not crazy about that, but I know a lot of people will be. You would have no committee, and it would be kind of NFL style where everything gets decided on the field. They'd bundle up the media rights. I mean, th th this would be very similar to what Chip Kelly talked about, which is a breakaway of college football to just be its own sport. Say everyone else can play in the conference that makes the most sense. ACC teams play ACC schools. Former Pac-12, play the Pac-12. Big 10, play the Big 10. Everyone would be able to do that, and then college football would just exist in this landscape. I'm just going to plant my flag right now for whatever it is worth and say, I think this proposal foundationally is very good for a couple of reasons. Number one, you could have a return to regionality being the driving force for college football schedules, college football matchups, and just college football games and interest and intrigue and pageantry and tradition. Number two, you would not have anybody get left behind because 70 permanent members would be comprised of the former Power Five conferences. So those leagues would make up the permanent members who stay at the top. You do not have equal revenue sharing here, which is how it would be different from the NFL. You'd have unequal revenue sharing to, according to, to the reports, the brands that bring in the most money and such, television ratings, whatever, that can all get sorted out. You could have, rather than piecemeal media rights, where you have this conference has got to deal with this league, this conference has got to deal with that network over there and, and such, you could have a more consolidated vision. That's certainly one of the hurdles that this faces. But you would also have a structure that allows for the group of five schools to still have access to the playoff, which I don't think is inherently a bad thing. When Cincinnati got to the 14 playoff, and look, 
I'd rather have a four or a six team playoff before any of this. But when you accept that the change is going to arrive, which of course it is, you got to make the best of that situation. And this would be a great proposal. Now, this is nowhere near the final stages, right? These are discussions. These are conversations. These are proposals, presentations, and trying to understand what's possible. So nothing has been set in stone for this potential Super League. But giving the group of five access to it, I don't think is a bad thing at all because there are a lot of great group of five football programs out there. So if you're listening to or watching the show and you're a fan of a Mountain West school or you're a fan of a Sunbelt school or an American Conference school or Conference USA or wherever, that relegation model, which, you know, generally speaking, I am a fan of the U.S. being the U.S. and Europe being Europe, but Europe does this better than the United States. I will freely admit that. That's the only thing I'll concede because our football is better than their football, but their structure is indeed superior in that it has the relegation model to create urgency, excitement, and intrigue for the end of season games for teams that are, are not having great years. And so you would have in that eighth division, 10 teams and, and the top 10, there'd be a relegation format where you can get into that division, but then you can also fall out of that particular division. But again, there would be 70 permanent tier one teams. And you'd have over 50 uh, at, at the tier two level. So I think that that structure gives a lot of people what they would want and could also create a better product for fans than what we're going to be getting in the 12 team format. Now, the timeline for this it is, is certainly one of the hurdles. It is certainly one of the obstacles because You've got a college football playoff television and, and structure that has been agreed, uh, a television contract and structure that's been agreed upon for the next two years. So for 2024 and 2025, we're going to have the 12-team playoff and you're going to have the four power leagues. That's what it's going to be. The question for this proposed you know, college sports tomorrow is, can it get started by 2026? Television contracts make that immensely challenging. Because remember, the Big Ten, the SEC, the ACC, the Big 12, they have deals that run at a minimum to at least 2027 is when the ACC deal could have an opt-out involved with it. 20, the early 2030s is when the Big 12, Big 10, SEC deals all run towards. And then the college football playoff deal exclusively with ESPN I believe has been confirmed, you know, it, it was it was announced and then it was, no, this hasn't been confirmed. No, but they are going to do this. They're still kind of working on finalizing all of those details. And this is the sort of plan that could throw a wrench into all of those plans because this would be a, a massive, massive undertaking. But I think that understanding that there are tier one programs and there are tier two programs is perfectly logical and reasonable to anybody who knows anything about college football. To pretend that, you know, you, you can say, well, you know, Boise State's really good in their conference and Alabama's really good in their conference. Like, we all know that that's not the same. I think this recognizes that. I think you've got a return to regionality. You've got no one left behind. You've got a consolidation of where the media rights could go. Just at a glance for, for where everything is at conversationally and what the proposals could be, I think this could be awesome. I, I think it could be awesome and ensure that teams are not left behind, which I think is just an absolute travesty and should be avoided at all costs. And this move could help to ensure that. Miami's trying to ensure that they're a conference contender this year. What's going on in Coral Gables with the Hurricanes? We're checking in right after this. Before we get to Miami, did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood robinhood.com slash boost subscription fees apply and now for some legal info info 
Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% match on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, member SIPC, is a registered broker-dealer. Year three under Mario Cristobal for the Hurricanes. What sort of pressure is on their head coach? Alex Dono, Locked On Canes, joining me here on the show. Just answer that question off the top, Dono. What sort of pressure is on Mario Cristobal this year? Well, not as much as people may think because he's heading into the the third year of a 10-year, $80 million contract. And so, you know, if anyone out there is saying, hey, he's on the hot seat, and if they don't achieve goal X, Y, or Z – He's going to get fired. Uh, I, I think it, it it would take something pretty catastrophic for him not to make it to year four, because obviously the farther you get into the 10 year deal, the more manageable the buyouts and the settlements would get. But with that said, I don't want to make it sound like there's no pressure. Um, there's definitely pressure for Mario Cristobal with, with the type of talent that he's been bringing down to Coral Gables um, and just being the fact that the results on the field have not been good enough for his first two seasons at Miami, there is an automatic amount of pressure that comes into that. And while I don't think his seat could get scorching hot next year, it can definitely get warm next year, Spencer, if things don't go a certain way. And you obviously, you put pressure on yourself in a good way. I don't think Mario would have it any other way when you bring in a quarterback like Cam Ward, which is, it's it's making a statement out there that you, you want to compete and win, quote unquote, win, whatever that means. Like, I'm not saying Miami should be a college football playoff or anything like that, but you definitely, you, you're you're putting a lot of your, they, Miami does have a lot of eggs in the long-term basket with the types of recruiting classes they've been bringing in, but you also put eggs in the short-term basket when you bring someone like Cam Ward in, because you're definitely sending the message out there. When we bring in Cam Ward for one year, we're not in rebuilding mode anymore. Yeah, I, I think when you add a guy who, momentarily was in the NFL draft, but decides, no, Miami's the place that I want to go play my last year of college football. He's certainly wanting to have a huge year as well because he wants to boost his draft stock, but he also wants to try and find something he wasn't able to get at Washington State, and that's a team that's capable of you know contending for a conference championship. And Washington State fans have their own thoughts on Cam Ward over the last couple of years. I I've always been a fan you know, when he came over from Incarnate Word, there were some turnover issues and th those can still persist a little, but his high level throw making and playmaking ability is really, really good. So I, I liken Mario Cristobal to, to Brian Kelly. They're both going into year three. They're both big names. They're at big programs. And thus far, Brian Kelly's results have, of course, been much better. But are they up to the standard that that coach was hired to bring to the football program? I'd say no. They have not reached that standard yet. Doesn't mean they can't. Means that they just haven't quite gotten to where fans and donors perhaps were hoping they would be. And I like the way you put it. You, you can't get on the hot seat this year. I've said that about Brian Kelly. I think your seat can start to warm up a little because I think as you push towards the midway point of any long-term coaching contract, that's when I think universities and athletic departments are willing to think about buyouts and such. But the expectations for Miami are very high this year. FanDuel's got their win total at nine and a half, Dono. That's the second highest for any team anywhere in all of college football. Is Miami ready to live up to that? Uh, I my my very way too early tentative prediction is nine and three. So my literal answer to that question would be not quite or no, somewhere between no and not quite. But with that said, um, I the the I think that there there was kind of an understanding. Not I'm not speaking for every Miami Hurricanes fan, believe me, because a lot of people were just shouting and screaming about you know last season. Oh, what this guy doesn't know what he's doing. There, there's plenty of there's plenty of people like that as there are in most any fan base. But I think when it comes to the powers that be, I think there was a certain understanding and grace given to Cristobal in the first couple of years, knowing that uh, the, his predecessor didn't do a good job when it came to recruiting and culture building and that they kind of understood, hey, Cristobal, I think it's the reason why they gave him a 10-year deal in the first place. We need you to do a bit of a demolition here and a rebuild. Uh, but the certain amount of grace that you get in the first two years, once you've had two consecutive top 10 recruiting classes, and Miami's done 
pretty well in the transfer portal with Ward, you know, being the the prize acquisition there. I say pretty well because you know schools like Florida State, for example, had been you know, crushing it in a way Miami hasn't in the portal, but Miami's done pretty well there. Um, you get to a point now where the expectation it's around. I mean, obviously you can't win nine and a half games. It's a Vegas number, but the expectation is around that. The people look at the situation Miami's in heading into next year. When you have, you know, a returning thousand yard receiver in Xavier Restrepo and he and Ward, uh, I've seen them connect a number of times in practice and the, the chemistry already looks pretty good there. You know, when you have uh, a returning defensive lineman like Reuben Bain, who was uh, ACC defensive rookie of the year last year, when you have a returning running back like Mark Fletcher heading into his sophomore year and what should be is you know very well covering Oregon building offensive lines is not an, an issue for Cristobal and Alex Mirabal they're building a nice offensive line there so I, the expectation is around that Spencer when you think of nine wins or ten wins being a possibility uh, and then another thing and I, I talk about this a lot from a schedule standpoint um, Miami's schedule looks favorable heading into next year. Sometimes you don't know how good teams are until they get into their schedule, but um, I, I think Miami dodged a couple of a couple of ACC bullets when you don't have to play Clemson uh, this coming season. You avoid NC State, who's one of the better teams in the ACC. Miami does play Florida State every year, which is the toughest game on the schedule, but you get them at home this year. You played them pretty well on the road last year. Uh, so from a conference standpoint, Miami has a manageable schedule. Uh, you know, the out of conference schedule outside of Florida, you have some out of conference cream puffs going to Gainesville. The first game will be tough. But, um, you know, uh, unless they they neglect to take a handful of knees again this year, uh, I think nine to ten wins <laughs> should be a manageable thing. Yeah. And I think if you are in a power four conference and you've got double digit regular season wins, you're going to be talked about over the course of the year as a potential playoff team, not a guarantee, you know, 10 and two ACC, that's not the same as 10 and two SEC or 10 and two Big 10. And you know, the same goes for the Big 12, winning 10 games, it puts you in the conversation, but it doesn't feel like a lock. Whereas a 10 and two Big 10 or SEC team feels like they'd be a lock to at the very least get an at-large playoff berth. But as Miami goes through spring football here, and just a quick side note, that Florida game is one of my favorite college football games of the year. One of those fan bases, maybe Florida a little bit more than Miami based on what you're saying here. One of those fan bases is going to feel like our coach has figured it out. And one of those fan bases is going to stare at that 0 and 1 for an entire week with an in-state non-conference loss. Big, big stakes there for Florida and, and Miami in week one. But as the Canes go throughout spring football, what else are you looking for? Where, where does Miami need to be focusing on to improve to get to that 9-10 win range? Yeah, I think uh, I'll focus on uh, potential liabilities before I focus on strengths. Um, I think when the transfer portal opens again on April 15th, uh, I think they're going to be looking for a possible uh, experienced defensive back because there is a lot of experience, both that say a lot of inexperience at both at safety and cornerback. Uh, they they did address that at least partially, you know, by bringing in uh, Mish Powell from Washington, who started uh, I think every game last year for the Huskies, and he's an experienced guy in the defensive secondary. They have a returning experienced cornerback in Daryl Porter, who was good last year. There's a lot of question marks though around those players. Um, I, I think that they might, despite Miami's got a lot of running backs on the roster, a lot of them, but they don't have a lot of experienced running backs. And their most experienced guy, Henry Parrish, has decided to leave in the transfer portal. So I think they might look to add a running back. There could be certain spots that they want to just add. Even defensive end is another area where they have a lot of players, but a lot of inexperienced players on the edges. I think they're going to look to add an experienced defensive end. Uh, although I wouldn't call defensive end a weakness, but it's maybe not as deep as some people think it is uh, in terms of the good things that I've been seeing so far in spring football. Um, generally Miami's been doing a good job acquiring unique uh, explosive and bigger athletes. I, I've been covering Miami for a long time and there were a lot of years where you're thinking, Hey, why is that linebacker five ten? Why does he look like a safety? Why does that safety look like a high school cornerback? Like, you know, th there was just too much of that with players not being up to those standards. Um, you know, I, I look at some of the young guys. Uh, one of the guys, Spencer, who's been the talk of uh, of spring football so far is a, a true freshman, early enrollee freshman out of Bishop Gorman in Las Vegas, which is a powerhouse high school program there. Elijah Lofton, who is like, this kid can play every position. Like he he's, you know, he's a tight end on the roster, but 
He's been getting carries at tailback. He's been lining up wide. He's been looking very good. He looks like a good blocker so far. That was his reputation coming in. Uh, he's looked really special so far. Uh, Miami ha- brought in a, uh, an early enrollee linebacker uh, out of the state of Alabama, Bobby Pruitt, who's uh, who's been performing like a second or third year guy. A couple of their freshman wide receivers, Josiah Trader, who is at one of the top high schools down here uh, in South Florida, Shamanad Madonna, same high school with Jeremiah Smith, who's now at Ohio State. They were high school teammates and Nikar, a receiver out of Georgia, looking really good. And then, yeah, listen, the, the thing everybody wants to watch out there in practice has been uh, Cam Ward, who's he's looked as advertised. I mean, you, you mentioned this was a guy who had his toe dipped in the NFL draft pool for a little bit. And, you know, he does he does operate like an NFL quarterback out there in practice. Uh, and he seems to be putting in the extra work to try to build the chemistry. So I, I see a, a lot of positives. I mean, uh, we'll talk more about how we handicap the ACC in a bit. Uh, I don't necessarily put Miami at the top, but Miami should be near the top. In case there was any doubt for all of you that Dono is your number one source for Kane's information, he just laid out without trying a pretty good argument for it right there uh, with that spiel. And as he mentioned, we are going to get to where Miami fits into that ACC championship picture and who else could push Florida State and Clemson. First, let's talk about our friends over at Game Time. Dono, are you a Game Time kind of guy? Because I'm a Game Time kind of guy, both in the literal and in the ticketing sense. Because Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. You a baseball guy, Dono? I, I am, actually. Uh, unfortunately, the Miami Marlins are off to a terrible start, but I oh, get gosh. great deals on the tickets at game time. Exactly. That's what you call a silver lining, folks, and game time's doing that and so much more for you. They've got priority last-minute deals for you where you can go and get whatever tickets you want. Save up to 60% off buying last-minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. Save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. They've got all sorts of deals and the lowest prices you want for wherever you are going to go whether it's baseball college football whether it's the nba game time's the place to go take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account use code lockdown college for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-c-o-l-l-e-g-e you can see it below in the graphic here on youtube for 20 dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed Miami appears to be team number three in the ACC. Florida State and Clemson, that's the way the betting odds look. And then it's Miami. Dono, where do you feel the Hurricanes stand as as we move through spring football compared to the two programs that are seen as the heavyweights in the ACC this year? Uh, Miami should be able to push both of them, especially given what I talked about with what I feel is a pretty favorable schedule, even in the ACC. It's obviously it's never going to be as tough as an SEC or Big Ten schedule, but I think Miami avoided a couple of the the better teams that are always tough to get wins. I think missing NC State is big. I think the I I think the Wolfpack have had a great offseason. Yeah, and they they completely uh, negated Miami's offense last year, and it wasn't just Tyler Van Dyke with his signature uh, interceptions because <laughs> NC State really made it tougher tougher on him than it had to be. Uh, so it's like uh, Miami should very well be in that mix, Spencer, for a, a couple of the reasons. Like I do, um, you know, DJ Weungalale, I like him. I think, and, and he may have in certain areas a better supporting cast. I'm not positive on that based on what I'm seeing from Miami but it just in, in a straight up vacuum I, I would take Cam Ward over DJ we oh I would too oh I yeah I, I absolutely I, I think DJ for those on YouTube you saw me put my hand out like this I, I think he's fine yeah solid I don't think he's capable of being the reason you win games but he's definitely capable of being the reason that you didn't lose a game and he can help you win games. But we saw at Clemson, they tried it for, you know, a, a full season and it just did not work out very well that you can't run an offense through him the way you can, you know, a Cam Ward, for instance. Now, Ward, I think, will be in a complimentary offense because Mario Cristobal wants to run the ball behind those great offensive lines that he has built his entire coaching career. I think DJU is fine, but Florida State's roster is very good. Their talent acquisition in the transfer portal has been very, very good. One of the five best classes in all of college football. And I think that's, 
you know, kind of an interesting dynamic to see play out. Like coach during the game and quarterback or coach during the game, I'll take Florida State. Quarterback, I'll take Miami. Roster, probably edge Florida State. But how much of an edge is it really? Yeah, and, and I think um, where, where Florida State uh, in recent years has had an especially big edge against Miami, their defensive backfield is loaded. Like I talked about Miami's defensive backfield being kind of a work in progress. Flo Florida State always has uh, typically one of the, at least in the times when they've been good, they had a couple lean years recently. But when they're on top, they, they typically have a top defensive backfield. I think that's the case. Uh, they are uh, still deep despite losing some guys on the defensive line. And also, like I, I don't discount the advantage of having just done last year what Miami hasn't done in a very long time, and that's go undefeated in the regular season and win a conference championship. So even though, yeah, you lose Jordan Travis, you lose Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson, some other important offensive pieces, you know, to uh, to graduation or to the NFL. But Florida State, like you said, the talent acquisition has been good. Uh, Mike Norvell's doing a hell of a job there. Uh, in, in my mind, Florida State, until proven otherwise, should be favorites in the ACC. I think with Clemson, uh, I'm – I'm not in this new era of college football. I'm not sold on Dabo Sweeney, and I'm definitely not sold on Cade Klubnick. Uh, with that said, they still have tremendous athletes, and they are well coached. The issues that I have with Dabo are, you know, him not embracing the transfer portal. It's like become a trench he's dug himself into, where it's a point of pride for him. He doesn't bring in any transfers. He despises NIL. I know a lot of fans rally around him for that. I just I'm not convinced that that's sustainable in the current college football landscape. So I, I feel like. Clemson could be a team that, and I know every time we think they're going to underperform, they end up winning nine or 10 games anyway, but I, I think this could be a year where they fall off just a little bit. Uh, so with that said, I'm not automatically putting Miami in like the number two slot in the ACC because I think there's a couple of teams being slept on here, Spencer. I mean, we already talked about NC State, who I think is a little underrated. I think their win total is like eight and a half. Or it seven is indeed and a half. eight and a half eight for half. Dave Dorn and company. And then another one that's at eight and a half, I think, is underrated is Louisville. Uh, I, I think their quarterback mm. situation is going to be better this year than it was last year. And Jeff Brom, who already did a heck of a job in his rookie campaign as head coach at his alma mater, is heading into his second year. I really respect him as being uh, an offensive genius. I don't. I try not to use that term loosely. So I think I think Louisville's a little underrated, and Miami has them on the schedule on the road this year. They lost to them in a shootout at home at the end of last season. They have them on the road this year. That's one of the tougher games on the schedule. I put that right behind Florida State. Uh, and so, yeah, I think North Carolina is a bit of a wild card, but I don't know if like losing Drake may, I, I don't know how quickly they're going to bounce back from that. But I really look at, to me, in no particular order, except Florida State, I'll put them at the top, Florida State, and then in no particular order, Miami, Louisville, NC State, and of course, Clemson, but I think they might drop off a little bit. I, I, th I think to me, those are, those are the primary teams that, that I would worry about in terms of Miami, because I do think, Spencer, that... If Miami doesn't get to the ACC championship game, which there's no more divisions, top two records, if they don't get to that championship game, there is going to be some disappointment. Uh, you know, I guess if they were to get to it and win it, that would be the icing on the cake. But if they're not one of the top two records in the conference, I think there would be some disappointment among the fan base and among the decision makers. So I, I think Miami is building the type of roster where they are expected to compete uh, for that ACC championship game. Something I talk about here on the show all the time that everydayers are familiar with at this point is I have a hard time not liking or leaning in favor uh, of teams that return your coach, quarterback, and offensive coordinator. And at Clemson, you've got Dabo Sweeney, you've got Garrett Riley, you've got Cade Klubnick. Those three guys sure. were at the head of the table last year. Those three guys will be at the head of the table this year. Now, that's not to say that newcomers and new situations like Cam Ward at, at Miami can't work out potentially even better than Cade Klubnick. But I think when you have talented guys and you give them coaching continuity, it's a rare thing nowadays because the carousel can be so wild and crazy and such. But it's another reason in the SEC. Who do I really like? Georgia. You, oh, I mean, okay, that's not a, that's not a hot take or anything. But Breaking who do news. I? Yeah, 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 yeah. Big, yeah, big, ta big take. They're going out on a limb saying Georgia's good. But one of the reasons that I was talking about the other day on the show, I don't know who's stopping Georgia is you've got Mike Bobo back as the OC, Kirby at the head coach, and Carson Beck at quarterback, who I think is a stud. Who else do I like in the SEC? Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin, head coach and offensive coordinator, and then you've got Jackson Dart back at quarterback, or Texas, Quinn Ewers, Quinn Sar and, and Steve Sarkeesian. So 
I, I'm consistent with that philosophy, and that's why I have a hard time seeing Clemson falling off. But I think it'll be really telling if, if they do, because if if that core, right, with that talented of a quarterback, that high caliber of an offensive coordinator all returning, if it then doesn't work, then long-term questions about Dabo Sweeney in the modern era, I, I think, can be asked. And I want to get out of here on uh, with you on this today, Dono. I, I think that you've laid out well the teams that are, are most likely to contend for the ACC title. Florida State, Clemson, Miami will be in the mix, NC State could push. Who's another team, you know, Louisville you mentioned as well, but who's another team that might not be on everybody's radar that you're looking at as an ACC guy and saying, hey, I, I can't sleep on them. For a lot of people, the trendy pick is SMU. Yep. I, I, I think Rhett Lashley's good. And, and Preston Stone could, could have a really good year as he did a season ago. I just don't know about that G5 to, to – P4 jump. It didn't go great for the programs in the Big 12. Maybe SMU is different. But is that the team that you're looking at for, for what I described? It, it, it was. It was. Um, and, and another team, I, I don't think they're going to contend for an ACC championship, but I'm going to be fascinated to watch Duke. And I'm not saying they're going to be good because of what they lost, including Riley Leonard, heck of a player, a uh, big loss losing their quarterback to Notre Dame, who did he did have issues staying on the field, but when he was on the field, yeah, there he, we he go. Was, he was the big show there. But like, I, I'm very, I'm very intrigued uh, by what's going to happen with Malik Murphy at quarterback because I know that like he's one of those guys where the ceiling is so high, the floor is very low, uh, but the ability is through the roof, and I wonder what he can do there. And then of course, I bring up Duke because a, as a Miami guy, you know, I mentioned. Mario Cristobal's predecessor not doing a very good job stocking the cupboards with recruits and talent. And that predecessor is now the head coach of the Duke Blue Devils, Manny Diaz, who I have maintained is a heck of a defensive coordinator. And he just proved that at Penn State after having proved it at previous stops, including Miami, because he was the D.C. at Miami before he became the head coach. So he's getting his second go around now as a as a head coach. Power four job again for him back in the ACC. So. I don't necessarily think Duke's going to be good, but they could be if they can find some Malik Murphy magic. And Miami does have them at home on the schedule this year. So the, the Manny Diaz reunion is going to be one to watch. Yeah, I, I think the other teams are the two techs, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech. Virginia Georgia Tech's, Tech's making a good one. H H Haynes King Haynes had, King a, did had a, a nice better, year, better year than people realize because he, mm -hmm. he's Haynes King. It's easy not to notice the guy, but he had a fine year last year. Yeah, he, he absolutely did. Alex Dono, Locked On Canes, occasionally steps in for me here on Locked On College Football. Alex, appreciate it. Great, great stuff today. Always great joining you. Thank you so much. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll talk to you then.